Yes. Uh, so we are um, reading the book of Hosea. Last week we read chapters one through four. Unlike, unlike a few, probably the majority of the prophets we read, um, Hosea is going to take a few weeks to read. It's not super long, but um, there's a little bit more, a little bit more meat to it. Um, as I said last week, of at least the minor prophets, Hosea is the the first in that list, and they're not normally the, the books of the Bible in general aren't necessarily in chronological order, but in the prophets they're pretty close. So Hosea is before even the Assyrian invasion of the Holy Land or right at the beginning of it and well before Babylonian, which is probably 150, 200 years later. So six, right? Huh? 586, right? Which was 586. Yeah. So. <laughs> you have no idea how much my heart feels good when you. <laughs> uh, so Hosea is probably written around 750. BC um, and the Assyrian invasions right around there just a little after that so it's it's the beginning of that but well before 586 which is um, the fall of the temple and the invasion of the Babylonians so and the exile so um, there's not a specific date partly because the temple is not destroyed um, but with the Assyrian but it's it's around around this time um, and Jose is sort of um, unique in a couple ways. Um, one is that there's some um, kind of pers more personal information about the about the prophet than in a lot of books. It talked in the first couple of chapters about him him marrying someone who was a, a prostitute, um, and some of his personal relationships, which normally don't, you don't see in any of the prophet books. Um, and, um, and then there's a, 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 it sort of shifts a little bit in chapter four and we're in the middle of that part, which is shorter sort of, um, prophecies that are just a few lines at a time. Um, sometimes, you know, two to four verses at a time, um, about, about Israel or whatever, about other, other things, call to repentance. A lot of the prophets, um, be it during the time of the Babylonian invasion or the Syrian invasion, use the the invasion as a as a call to, you know, to be more morally upright. Well, you know, the reason you're going to be invaded is because is because you haven't, you know, you you haven't done well enough. You haven't worshipped God enough. You haven't been, you know, faithful enough. You have idols and that sort of thing. So we see a little bit of that in already in um, Hosea. So, chapter 5. Hear this, O priest. Give heed, O house of Israel. Listen, O house of the king. For the judgment pertains to you. For you have set a snare at Mitzpah, and a net spread upon Tabor, and a pit dug deep in Shittim. But I will punish all of them. I know Ephraim and Israel is not hidden from me. For now, O Ephraim, you have played the whore. Israel is defiled. Their deeds do not permit them to return to their God, for the spirit of whoredom is within them. They do not know the Lord. Israel's pride testifies against them. Ephraim stumbles in his guilt. Judah also stumbles with them. With their flocks and herds, they go to seek the Lord, but they will not find him. He is withdrawn from them. They have dealt faithlessly with the Lord. They have borne illegitimate children. Now the new moon shall devour them along with their fields. Blow the horn of Gibeah, the trumpet in Ramah, Sound the alarm at Beth Haven. Look behind you, Benjamin. Ephraim shall become a desolation in the days of pun in the day of punishment. Among the tribes of Israel, I declare what is sure. The princes of Judah have become like those who remove the landmark. On them I will pour out my wrath like water. Ephraim is oppressed, crushed in judgment, because he was determined to go after vanity. Therefore I am like maggots to Ephraim, and like rottenness to the house of Judah. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah his wound, then Ephraim went to Assyria and sent to the great king. But he is not able to cure you or heal your wound. For I will be like a lion to Ephraim and like a young lion to the house of Judah. 
I myself will tear and go away. I will carry off and no one shall rescue. I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face. In their distress, they will beg my favor. Well, the first thing is there's a lot of words, a lot of name, proper names in here. Um, so I think we need to look at what some of those things are. Um, in verse one, we have verse one and two, mitzvah, tabor, shittim, shittim. Um, do 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 I don't see a reference to what meat spy is or tabor. Maybe it's just individual cities where where they've been a stumbling block for the people or something. Oh, I well, I, my, so my my um, verse says um, the indictment of this verse is a is a divine loss. This is actually a lot of notes for just one verse here. Um, a divine lawsuit against the people for the breach of the covenant. Um, there's additional sort of courtroom language related to this. Faithfulness entails firm commitment to the Lord. Loyalty, a crucial term in Hosea's theology, is a quality of life required in covenantal relation with God. It is also It also appears translated as steadfast love. On knowledge of God, another crucial term in Hosea, um, knowledge of God issues from covenant instruction, a special responsibility of Israel's priests. So maybe there's something about the in the the, the priests aren't because it is addressed to the priests, right? The priests aren't aren't doing their job teaching the people, leading the people in the right way. Yeah, it says in mine that they uh, were taking cruel advantage of innocent people. Mm-hmm. But I have a question because there is a town in New Mexico, kind of down below uh, Grants and Gallup, and it's called Rama, and it was established by a Mormon group. Hmm. And I noticed that Rama, Rama, well, you call it Rama, is mentioned here, and I couldn't find anything about it. I was just wondering if there's a uh, a uh, a notation or something about that particular town or if there's, you know, because some of these, and, and after this, this paragraph, it says here in my book that, uh, that uh, the reference of uh, mountain at the southeastern edge of Jezreel, uh, which was a uh, Mizpah in Benjamin, must have been too well, must have been a reference to two well-known events that illustrated Israel's corruption. Right, yeah. So, I wonder what Rama is, or Rama, whatever they call it. Rama. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, for some reason, it's skipping some of those the the um, place names here, which in my Bible, which is a little frustrating. Sometimes it sometimes it gives them really well, but here it's not really. <laughs> or. It says Rama is a town north of Gilead, G Gibeah. Yeah, I have yeah, I have that in a separate area, but verse eight, uh, my Bible has an interesting definition for the uh, the the name Beth Aven. So it means, means house of wickedness. Oh really? Mm -hmm. And what's the significance of look behind you, Benjamin, in verse eight? My, you know, and this, but normally my Bible is, so the notes that are on the bottom of each, each, um, each book are mm -hmm. written by different theologians. And um, 
These were written by, I hope without somebody I know. <laughs> no, James Luther Mays. Sometimes they're really good. And these, I'm, I have tons of notes, but none of them like answer the questions that I have. Yeah. But yours yeah. say, look behind you, because mine says, um, mine says, sound the tr trumpet in, an, in chapter uh, verse eight, it says, sound the trumpet in Gabea, the horn in R Rama, raise the battle cry in Beth Avedon, lead on, O Benjamin. Oh, so it, look behind it, you, mine says, it, lead on. Look behind you here, yeah. Yeah, huh, that's interesting. Well, that's but, but it's, it's, it's obviously about about uh, getting the people back in line, right? You know, getting the people back in a moral moral code or whatever, in a general way. Yeah, yeah. I'm kind of disappointed with whoever wrote the notes for this for this particular book. There's lots of notes, but they don't they don't answer the questions I I want to ask. So oh. I wonder if. To answer my own question, that they, it, this says that the uh, that was the battle cry of oh. lead on, O Benjamin. Maybe that's where the with a, a ram's horn. Maybe that's where Rama comes from. Actually, I I, I found something in another part. Mithra Tabor and Shittim town the shrines of the Baal cult. Baal was a a, a foreign uh, god. Eight. Give me a Beth Athen, towns in Benjamin's tribal territory along the path of invasion of the Judean army. There's a connection with the Syro Ephraimite War here, which is talked about in 2 Kings. So Judah invades Ephraim. So those are two of the tribes of Israel. So part of this is the tribes of Israel doing battle with each other and him saying that it's not a good thing to. Well, I, I thought Ephraim was referring to a person, but Ephraim is to a, to a one of the tribes. Yeah. And we know Judah is one of the tribes because Judah is one of the tribes at the time of Jesus. Um, Israel here is one of the tribes too. So it's... Um, Benjamin was a tribe too, wasn't it? Benjamin was a tribe too, yes. Um, but Judah invading Ephraim is part of the problem here. Hmm. Um, but Ephraim had an alliance with Syria. And in, it says in verse 13, um, after the Syro-Ephraimite initiative failed and Assyria invaded the land, Israel surrendered territory and paid tribute to Assyria. Hmm. Hmm. But so in a way, what this is doing is it's saying that um, Ephraim was maybe the last of the, of the 10 other tribes to go away because by the time, not long from this, there's really only two tribes. So Ephraim was a, one of the last, other than Judah and Israel, to go away. And it was not like it was because they, they allied with the enemy, with Assyria. Mm -hmm. um, which says in verse 13, uh, then Ephraim went to Assyria and sent to the great king. Yeah. Hmm. You know, it's it's a it's a little bit of a side a side note, but um, the I think one of the saddest things that we see in Scripture is the people came to the chosen land, and within some time they they fought mostly among each other until there there was a lot fewer. Mm -hmm. um, you know that they, that they eliminated their own their own people. Yeah. And we're still doing that today. For sure. Um, sorry, I just had a very important text. Uh, okay. Um, 
yeah, I think I think the hard part about this chapter is there's so many proper names you have to figure out what they're talking about. I almost want to read it again because all the Ephraim and Israel and Judah, obviously, we know are the um, <laughs> are the are the tribes. Yeah. Going back to going back to verse three, I know Ephraim and Israel is not hidden from me. For now, Eve, oh Ephraim, you have played the whore. Israel is defiled. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's also kind of interesting on uh, chapter uh, verse 13, it says, when Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah his sores, oh. Ephraim turned to Assyria and sent to the great king for help. But he is not able to cure you, not able to heal your sores. So, in other words, God says, forget it, you know, you, you can't turn to anybody but me. And you yeah. haven't done that yet, so you're going to be blown away like a whirlwind. <laughs> right. You're, you're, it's not going to help you to go to Assyria. Right. right. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I like that. Blown away by a whirlwind. It was, a, it was the uh, last uh, verse on chapter four, because we know all about those. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I, I, I preached about the wind. I mentioned the wind in my sermon a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, Chapter six, come, let us return to the Lord, for it is he who has torn and he will heal us. He has struck us and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His appearing is as sure as the dawn. He will come to us like the showers, like the spring rains that water the earth. My, my initial thought right this second is, why is this in quotes? Is it quoting something else? Hosea pr presents a parody of the people's current insufficient gestures at penitence. Um, I always read it that just, you know, the whole last chapter is you're bad. And the whole next, that next part is I still love you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I still love you. There's, there's, um, so some of the language is a little bit, you know, on the third day, he will raise us up. We think that might be about, maybe that's a connection to Jesus. Um, yeah. But what it says, I don't know idea here, but mine says, revive us and raise us up, reflect the mythology of the fertility cult in which bales rising from death restored both people and nature to new life. Oh. So it's interesting. I don't know that I would have read that in that if I hadn't, if this person hadn't said that. Yeah. So it's, it's not only in that case, what the, what the, what the, the person who did the commentary here is saying is it's not just a, a, a call to repentance, but also a reminder of what you need to repent for, I guess, mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, what shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? Your love is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes away early. Therefore, I have hewn them in by the prophets. I've killed them by the words of my mouth, and my judgment goes forth as the light. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. But at Adam, they transgressed the covenant. There they dealt faithlessly, faithlessly with me. Gilead is a city of evildoers tracked with blood. As robbers lie in wait for someone, so the priests are banded together. They murder on the road to Shechem. They commit a monstrous crime. In the house of Israel, I have seen a horrible thing. Ephraim's whoredom is there. Israel is defiled. For you also, O Judah, a harvest is appointed when I would restore the fortunes of my people. Goodness. Is that, is that literally, or is it just another condemnation of the priests? Um, I don't know. Um, this, 
the beginning, O Ephraim, O Judah, you know, it feels a little bit like hoping for, for unity among the people. Um, it does feel like, I, I think we've seen that in a couple other chapters, that there's some, some condemnation of the priests in general, right? That they're not doing a good enough job pulling, pulling the people together. I, Adam is not Adam like from Genesis. That's a place, I think. Um, uh, maybe not. I don't know. Joshua three sixteen. Okay. Joshua was the first book after the Torah, so it's kind of an important book. Um, just out of curiosity, that's the reference that to Adam. Mm -hmm. It's also it is Adam. Um, the waters flowing up from flowing from above stood still, rising up in a single heap, far off at Adam, the city that is beside Zarethan while those flowing toward the Sea of the Arab by the Dead Sea were wholly cut off. It's the Jordan providing fresh water for the faithful people and not for the not faithful people. The priests are banded together. They murder on the road to Shechem. Yeah. <laughs> My book is, says that um, that might be uh, an says the illusion is unclear, but Hosea may have been referring to a more recent event than the bloodbath of uh, J D G, referring to a uh, such as Hekah's rebellion against he Hekahiah. Hezekiah. So honestly, they did just pretty much wipe each other out i mean were they fighting against each other it sounds like yep, it for sure i also my also has a note about the priests of 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 um, holy sites in that area might be harassing pilgrims who visit it mm -hmm. um but it's not totally sure um samaria is the capital of ephraim we think of the samaritans mm -hmm. And the the what is known as the the region of that of that tribe of Ephraim of Samaria is between Judah and Israel. So that's why it's the we often hear the divided kingdom or the northern kingdom or the southern kingdom. And I, I I've, I've said this before, but I find this I find this pretty fascinating that um, Jesus is born in the northern kingdom, Galilee, Nazareth. That's all in the northern kingdom, the Sea of Galilee. But Jerusalem, Bethany, some of those other places are in the southern area. So he has to travel through Samaria, mm -hmm. the new places. That's something I didn't realize, even though I had some geography and a lot of history in in seminary, is that they're not they don't share a border, right? So Jesus is going between the two areas and going through non-Jewish lands or previously Jewish lands, right? There, it's a it's a tribe of Israel, but they've gone away from from the Jewish laws and customs. I, the most, the most, um, maybe the most important story from sort of a historical note in that way is the story of the woman at the well. Mm -hmm. Because she is a Samaritan and Jesus is there and he, you know, talks with her and all that, but, um, and he knows all about her and he, she identifies him as the Messiah. But, mm -hmm. But there's a line in there that she says, um, well, you say you had to worship in the temple, but we have always worshiped on the, on the top of the mountains. And here at our ancestor Jacob's well, well, the, Jacob is the ancestor of the Jewish people too, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So it's a big hint that yes, they're, they're enemies and they're foreigners, but they're really just long lost cousins and brothers mm -hmm. and sisters. Um, it, it, just that part of the language is fascinating, right? So that's the tribe of Ephraim, which becomes Samaria. I mean, over 
you know, a long time. <laughs> but I mean, here we're at seven, we're 750 BC. By the time the temple falls in, what year? 586. 586. Which is 150 years from now. Ephraim isn't a, Ephraim isn't no more. Right, Ephraim's not a not a tribe anymore, um, and by the time of Jesus, five hundred eighty-six late, years later, it's it's some, some they don't even remember at that point that Samaria was one of the twelve tribes, mm -hmm. essentially, right? Because they, they're constantly called enemies and stuff, but they were six hundred fifty years before one of the twelve tribes of Israel. Hmm. But it looks like I mean it's interesting to think that. The other tribes were mostly um, dispersed or whatever because of interfighting and also invasion because they're in the northern part of that area. Ephraim, which lies between Judah and Israel, the only reason that they're gone is because they allied with Assyria and, and Judah and Israel didn't, um, which is kind of sad <laughs> in a way. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's a lot of, a long time though, of uh, a, a long period of time to be fighting amongst themselves. So they really didn't have a whole lot of cohesive and cohesiveness, you know? Oh, well, the whole concept of having 12 tribes, we'd have to go back to the Torah to, to look into why that happened. Almost, almost invites, you know, arguing over property and arguing over you know the space that they're using and arguing over borders and you know arguing over customs right rather than saying we're one nation we're one nation but we're 12 tribes that each have our own sort of differences mm -hmm. um yeah it's 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 and then they're really are at least i mean you wouldn't think of it today but in in terms of the modern world they're one nation that's spread out really far. Um, so if they are supposed to be dependent on themselves for their own defense and their own, rather than on the whole of the nation, then when those Northern tribes fall, they don't have any, they don't have any backup. Right. So um, we're, I'm gonna continue on chapter seven here. Um, when I would heal Israel, the corruption of Ephraim is revealed and the wicked deeds of Samaria, that for they deal falsely, the thief breaks in and the bandits raid outside. But they do not consider that I remember all their wickedness. Now their deeds surround them. They are before my face. By their wickedness, they make the king glad and the officials by their treachery. They are all adulterers. They are like a heated oven whose baker does not need to stir the fire from the kneading of the dough until it is leavened. On the day of our king, the officials will, uh, became sick with the heat of wine. He stretched out his hand with mockers, for they are kindled like an oven. Their heart burns within them. All night their anger smolders. In the morning it blazes like a flaming fire. All of them are hot as an oven, and they devour their rulers. All their kings have fallen. None of them calls upon me. Ephraim mixes himself with the peoples. Ephraim is a cake not turned. That's interesting. Foreigners devour his strength, but he does not know it. Gray hairs are sprinkled upon him, but he does not know it. Israel's pride testifies against him, yet they do not return to the Lord their God or seek him for all this. Wow. Wow, I mean, you can just... It's it that's it's fascinating. You can just look in the words and see the decline of this tribe because mm -hmm. it's allied with this enemy that's beginning to invade the land. It's helping the enemy attack those other parts of the land. That's just oh. even in the sort of poetic way of it, it's still the thief breaks in, the bandits right outside because of Ephraim, right? Um. Hmm. Uh, 
Oh. <laughs> Reed, let's see, where did you stop? Uh, at 10? Uh, yeah, after 10. All right, R read 11. <laughs> He from has become like a dove, silly and without sense. Okay. <laughs> they call upon Egypt, they go to Assyria. I mean, this whole this whole this whole chapter and part of the last chapter is just about this tribe of Israel essentially going away from the rest of the of the people. Yeah, it's downfall. Yeah, it's all about Ephraim's downfall. There's so, there's so many interesting. Uh, kind of analogies in here. They are like, they are all adulterers. They are like a heated oven whose baker does not need to stir the fire from the kneading of the dough until it is leavened. Mm. Ephraim mixes himself with the peoples. Ephraim is a cake not turned. Yeah, I like that one. <laughs> well, and with the, the description of the dough, you can almost just see him like fomenting uh, all kinds of. Um, anger and uh you know i don't know why i'm trying to think of the word that i want but it, it's just it's building up like when you make bread and you know it rises and it's just all all of the eastern side is just going crazy well that's you what don't i i make bread often if you don't punch it down once it's yeah. done, it doesn't turn out very good yeah well they needed yeah. to punch it down a lot and they and they didn't this my note on verse eight here says the metaphor of a cake made up of foreign ingredients and half baked made mm -hmm. up of yep. foreign yep. ingredients and and not cooked properly right <laughs> huh the fact that they were actually calling upon assyria and egypt and other countries to defeat their own people because they felt like they were their enemies it's right. not very smart, you know. I can see why Hosea was getting a little angry with him. Right, and and remember, I, I mean, I just said this, but at the time of Jesus, there's no such thing as the tribe of Ephraim. Mm -hmm. mm. So I, I'm I'm just I'm just visualizing, you know, like imagining someone in that in that in that tribe. They were literally sort of tribe, right? They belonged to this tribe. I'm of the tribe of Ephraim, and having you know, they were there. Their name badge of the tribe of Ephraim, right? But 600 years later, no one knows what that even means anymore because their own ally and with enemies have has destroyed themselves within from within. Which goes to that thing, you know, the in verse nine, um, foreigners devour his strength, but he does not know it. Gray hairs are sprinkled upon him, but he does not know it. Yeah. You know, it's <laughs> they don't understand what they're doing to themselves. Right. Destroying themselves from within. Mm -hmm. um, Ephraim has become like a dove, silly and without sense. Gosh, I love that. Yeah. Um, they call upon Egypt, they go to Assyria. As they go, I will cast my net over them. I'll bring them down like birds of the air. I will discipline them according to the report made to their assembly. Woe to them, for they have strayed from me. Destruction to them, for they have rebelled against me. I would redeem them, but they speak lies against me. They do not cry to me from the heart, but they wail upon their beds. They gas themselves for grain and wine. They rebel against me. It was I who trained and strengthened their arms, yet they plot evil against me. They turn to that which does not profit. They have become like a defective bow. Their officials shall die by the sword because of the rage of their tongues so much for their bab so much for their babbling in the land of egypt yeah wow mm -hmm. i think the idea that that first verse you verse 11 ephraim has become like a dove and then fillion without sense um we don't look upon doves as silly without sense, but it, it's, the dove is a symbol of peace. Well, well a us. modern symbol of peace, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but if you ever had anything to do with them, you'll know that they're, as my book says, deceived and senseless. Yeah. <laughs> they're not real smart. The closest, <laughs> the closest relative to a dove is a pigeon. Yeah. Oh, okay, well, okay. silly and dumb. Uh, yeah. I have, I have, I, I, they're pretty common in this area, so I'm sure you all know too. I have turtle doves in my 
in my backyard often. They eat the they eat off my bird feeder, and they look like pigeons, but they've got slightly smaller heads. Mm. So they're they're sort of in between turtle uh, t- uh, doves and pigeons. But yeah, if you think of pigeons being dumb rats, dumb city rats with wings, yeah. that's that's doves are pretty closely related to that. So how do we come to symbolize peace with the dove? Noah. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Because it wasn't peace between people, it was peace between God and man. Mm-hmm. That when, when the dove returns with the olive branch, mm-hmm. it will symbolize a covenant made between God and the people. Yeah. It mm-hmm. will, they, will not be, they will not be destroyed any longer. Yeah. Or, or the description of, of the dove descending upon Jesus. Yeah. Or like, like a dove. Yeah. But I think that's I think that's covenantal also, meaning I think that's it's not saying the dove is is smart. Yeah. <laughs> but it's it's saying it's a reminder of the covenant between God and the people with Noah is part okay. of why it's used with the descending like a dove on right. They are beautiful birds, especially those the white dove. They're quite beautiful. Yeah. But some beautiful f- things and beautiful people are still kind of stupid. <laughs> 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 okay. Should not have said that. That was bad. Well, that was true. True, true. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it, it, this is, um, gosh, such a strong condemnation against, against Ephraim, against that, mm-hmm. that tribe. Okay, so did, did he get out and, and actually preach this to the people? Or did, was this written afterwards as kind of a uh, description of what actually happened? Usually the way prophets worked is they, you know, they stood on a corner or somewhere and preached it first and then it was written down. Mm-hmm. Or, or they, or, well, it was always verbally and written down, right? If it's written down, they may have written it first, but they definitely did it at the time. So they're definitely preaching against the people at the time, not later. Okay. Where he's located geographically is probably almost as important. If you're doing it in Jerusalem or in Galilee, it's very different from doing it in the middle of, of Ephraim. That would not have been safe for a prophet to do that, right? No, he wouldn't uh, be around very long. Right. So you assume that he's in one of those, in Judah or Israel, one of those safe kingdoms, not in the middle of, of Ephraim. But I don't know. Yeah, but- but what good does it do if he's not there? Right. <laughs> okay. I mean, if he's preaching to the people in Judah, they're going to be going, yeah, get rid of them. We don't like them anyway. Right, right. <laughs> um, wow, okay. So I'm looking back at the, at the I have a couple pages of um, sort of introduction. Um, Alienated from society's new hierarchical arrangement, Hosea confronted apostasy at the royal capital of Samaria and the royal sanctuaries of Bethel and Gilgal as a dissident. So he was in that area. Yeah. Yeah. In chapter six, there's a verse that reminds me of Micah. And it is uh, verse six. And it said, for I desire mercy, not sacrifice, an acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. Yeah, well, oh, that, I forgot about that. Yeah, that's interesting because even at the time of Jesus, they're still doing burnt offerings. Yes. So to see a prophet 100, 750 years before that saying, I don't mm-hmm. desire burnt offerings mm-hmm. is actually very brave. Um, mm-hmm. It does say, I'm going back to the, um, it does say that um, Hosea was at first in the northern kingdom, Israel, and then gradually it, it sounds like he may have been in the, in the central area, in the Samaria area. Yeah, the, the idea that, because, so how they worshipped, um, we know that a little bit from, you know, the, when Jesus overturned the tables in the temple, they would buy animals and, and sacrifice them on an altar, literally mm-hmm. have them killed on an altar. Um, and, and then their bodies would be burned, roasted, essentially. You know, that, that's, um, 
the fact that this prophet 750 years before the time of Jesus says, I am your God, and that's not the kind of worship I need, mm -hmm. is pretty profound, actually. Yeah. Um, especially since there's other places where that sort of worship is, is lifted up as good. For a prophet to stand up against that, too, is, is interesting. Um, Um, the, you notice that the, the title for the next section, at least in mine, is Israel's apostasy, which is Israel going away from God. So we've already been lambasting Ephraim, but now Israel, which is the Northern, Northern Kingdom, is also going away from God, mm -hmm. according to the prophet. We know that just from the title. Yeah. Um, I think we have time to do, we'll do eight. Can I say something real quick? Yeah. In the beginning of mine, it says, this is the background. Mm -hmm. It says, Hosea lived in the tragic final days of the Northern Kingdom, during which six kings reigned within 25 years. So man, they were in and out, you know? So no wonder they had no stability, you know? Right. By, by the time that was, in, that was in, the, in the Northern Kingdom? Mm -hmm. Right. He said he lived in, he was in, in the final days of the Northern Kingdom. So by the time the last king was, um, was killed, which was the guy that starts with a P, P-E-K-H-I-I-I-A, something um, like that. Um, I see King Jeroboam and... Because it says there were four of them were murdered by their successors in office. Oh yeah, King Hosea, mm -hmm. not Hosea, Hosea, King Jeroboam, King Hezekiah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, by the time the Assyrians had expanded that far, right. uh, they had that, Ephraim had really no... They no, had, they had a, a yeah. vacuum of leadership, basically. Well, Right. Yeah. Uh, set the trumpet to your lips. One like a vulture is over the house of the Lord, because they have broken my covenant and transgressed my law. Israel cries to me, my God, we, Israel, know you. Israel has spurned the good. The enemy yeah. shall pursue him. They made kings, but not through me. They set up princes, but without my knowledge. With their silver and gold, they made idols for their own destruction. Your calf is rejected, O Samaria. My anger burns against them. How long will they be incapable of in innocence? For it is from Israel an artisan made it. It is not God. The calf of Samaria shall be broken to pieces. For they sow the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. The standing grain has no heads. It shall yield no meal. If it were to yield, foreigners would devour it. Israel is swallowed up. Now they are among the nations as a useless vessel. For they have gone up to Assyria, a wild ass wandering alone. Ephraim has bargained for lovers. Though they bargain with the nations, I will now gather them up. They shall soon writhe under the burdens, burden of kings and princes. When Ephraim multiplied altars to expiate sin, they became to him altars for sinning. Though I write for him this, the multitude of my instructions, they are regarded as a strange thing. Though they offer choice sacrifices, though they eat flesh, the Lord does not accept them. Now he will remember their iniquity and punish their sins. They shall return to Egypt. Israel has forgotten his maker and built palaces. And Judah has multiplied fortified cities. But I will send a fire upon his cities and it shall devour his strongholds. Wow. Everybody's, everybody's struggling to follow God. <laughs> And not doing a very good job of it. Yeah. Because the only three tribes we're talking about here are Israel, Judah, and Ephraim. And all three are, are said to be not doing what they're supposed to be doing in this chapter. Yeah. Not as much as, as Ephraim it was in the previous chapters. But there's some, some condemnation of, of Judah and Israel here too. Do you ever wonder what the prophets would say about us today? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So there's a, um, the 
the gospel lesson for this week is um, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that stones the prophets. Um, how long must I bear with you? Yeah. Um, I go out into the country because no prophet can be killed outside of Jerusalem. Yeah. Yeah. You, 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 it makes you think about who are the prophets today, right? Who are the, yeah. who are the ones that are being stoned to death or, yeah. or whatever? Yeah. It's interesting. It says Israel has broken the covenant through the monarchy's policy. So it's kind of what you were talking about, Nancy. Mm -hmm. um, through foreign relations and through hypocritical rights. So the 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 kings are are making poor policy, and it's relating with other outside places. Um, You know, I never realized that uh, sow the wind and reap the whirlwind was, says here, it's a familiar proverb um, that's been used through, through the Old, Old Testament. Um, Job, Psalms, um, actually the New Testament also. And I, I just um, never actually thought about it. You know, when you, you use phrases or you hear phrases, or you read phrases like that, you never really think about what they actually mean or where they came from. That always fascinates me. Right. I, you know, I find it interesting. I, I, I just was looking at the, the talk about the calf that's going to be built out of mm -hmm. gold and silver. Remember that happened in, in the Exodus. Mm -hmm. And some, at least here, it's a reference to the worship of Baal. So they're, they're creating this calf to worship like they did in the Exodus. Mm -hmm. um, and the calf of Samaria shall be broken to pieces. Like the people constantly are creating the talk of idols, which is all throughout the Old and New Testaments. You know, the the people are constantly coming up with 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 alternatives to worshiping God. Just having, but that, but that's so actually foreign to everything that they had known ever since Egypt. I mean, you know, Egypt has hundreds of gods, all and the, all of the other countries, you know, Assyria, Babylonia, all those countries, all the, they yeah, all- yeah, But they were a week out of Egypt and they built a golden calf. I mean, yeah. maybe, maybe not a week, but pretty quick out of Egypt <laughs> built a golden right. calf to, to worship it. So this has been their history from the very beginning, even oh. though they're one people with one God. They're constantly creating idols to worship. Yeah. I mean, from the very beginning. Maybe it was part of the example from Egypt, right? I don't know. I think it would just be hard to break away from that type of a, a civilization that you've known all your life. You know, I mean, to wander in the desert, to eat manna, to, you know, I mean, to, to just trust in something you can't see. That would be, and that's the hardest thing for all of us now, mm -hmm. you right. know? Yeah. Well, and I think, I think, you know, the other part about that, I try not to make this a sermon, but <laughs> the other part, if I'm preaching on this, you know, that we really do create idols. They may not be, you know, the, the icon of, of another religion or something like that, like a, like a, a little idol. But we do idolize stuff. We do put stuff ahead of, ahead of God all the time. Mm -hmm. We have our own golden calves all the time. Yeah. Um, we all do. Um, so it's sort of you know interesting for us to say, well, those people they shouldn't have done that. You yeah. Know? <laughs> well, that's easy to say. Hindsight is great, isn't it? <laughs> but we have our own level of, you know, hypocrisy in the whole process. Yeah. Yeah. Israel has forgotten his maker and built palaces, and Judah has multiplied fortified cities. Hmm. Well, now he's even picking on the southern kingdoms, too. Because Judah is a southern kingdom. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, we will end there for today, and maybe we'll finish it next week. We'll see what happens.
Um, let's pray. Let's end this with prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for revealing it to us, for giving us the courage to, to open it up and to look at it with, um, with new set of eyes, with courage, with curiosity. Thank you for giving us the ability to do that. Thank you for giving us also your love and your grace. All this and we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Ooh, again for Bible study. <laughs>